welcome back to uh, Life Education's podcast again. We are slightly different today. We're set up in a coffee shop um, doing an audio-only version because we've got Andrew Hallam with us again and Caroline. Say hello, Andrew. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed that uh, we don't have the video because I worked so hard on my hair this morning. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. You can tell. It looks great. We can, we can vouch for that. It well, looks do, you, do you know what's really funny about last time you came on? I'll never forget your comment when you thought that we were filming it outside in a garden and you guys were so cute. You came in shorts and flip-flops <laughs> <laughs> and T-shirts. So this time, by comparison, you're dressed uh, very, very nicely. I, I, you also I dressed nicely last time. <laughs> but to be honest, yes, that's true. lots of people have thought that we, we do it in a garden. So for anybody listening now, we don't just do it in a garden. It's just the deck or then the room that we're in, it looks like a garden. Yeah. <laughs> it looks real. So after that, we had a lot of other people also turn up in shorts and t-shirts. Yeah. And I was saying to them, like, um, interestingly about your story and about how you thought <laughs> we were in a garden. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, quite funny. So know that I r- retell that to people. <laughs> yeah, You're, but you were the first of many. <laughs> to have that consideration. Anyway, we're in uh, we're in a coffee shop. There's a little bit of background noise, so forgive us for that. Um, we'll do our best to edit it out, but you may just have to make do with some banging and clashing in the backgrounds. Uh, because we wanted to take this opportunity. Andrew's in town for a few days. You're back from your world travels. Um, you give, you've given a couple of talks locally, Abu Dhabi during the week, and you've got one in Dubai tomorrow. What's the general gist of these conversations? The what I'm enjoying about this this one is usually I come and I talk about the, the contractual savings schemes, and and if you're listening and you've heard you haven't heard me for at all if today's the very first time, my whole gist on the contractual savings schemes is to stay away from them. Mm-hmm. The products that are sold here are completely toxic. So they're sold by insurance companies. Mm-hmm. So you'll get these high commission sales people that are trying to talk you into 20, 25 year contractual savings plans. Mm-hmm. And they're horrible. And, and it gets a bit depressing just talking about this. So while I'm here this time, I want to talk about the psychology of a great investor. So in my book, Millionaire Teacher or Million- and Millionaire Expat, both books, I talk about how to invest. I guess most specifically, if you're an expatriate, Millionaire Expat is, is the book that is the, uh, the how-to guide. So I talk about the process of how to invest. And so for many people, that process is, okay, understand that. Um, and they, they go through the process, but there's so many uh, mental obstacles that get in people's way when they're, when they're investing. Much mm-hmm. has to do with <clears throat> the media. Much has to do with fear and greed. So to directly answer your question, the talks I'm going to be doing or have been doing through the UAE this time around are dealing with the, um, the mindset of a strong investor and how to overcome those mental obstacles. So, so what, what is the mindset of a strong investor? Maybe well, you can impart some light. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question, Caroline. Here's, here's the thing. If you, you show somebody how to invest in a portfolio of low-cost index funds, which is so simple. It is so simple. It takes about an hour a year of your time. You don't ever have to watch the economy. Uh, look at economic forecasts. You don't have to pick hot stocks or hot funds. You're simply buying a globally diversified stock market index, and that's your main base. So when doing that, you will beat like 95% of professional investors after fees Mm -hmm. over your lifetime. And, And that's not just my opinion. You have a whole slew of Nobel Prize winners in economics who will say exactly the same thing. The challenge is, and Warren Buffett says it really well, he says investing is simple, but it's not easy. So what happens with most investors is this. Let's say that uh, we have some great data on Americans. So let's say that a a U.S. stock market index, which is what many many of the intelligent investors in the United States buy, Mm. uh, let's say that an index produces a return of... 8% 8% per year over a 15 year period. I'm just using that as an example. What will happen is the typical investor who buys that index over that same 15 year time period won't earn a return of 
8%, but they might earn a return of 6.5%. So you might wonder, wait a second, the product itself, let's say, earns an 8% return, but the people that invest in that same product earn 6.5%. Mm. How is that possible? And what typically happens is <laughs> when, when the economic news is dire, when you have people on the television, uh, on the radio telling you, oh, you know, stocks are going to fall, um, or even when stocks do dip a bit, mm -hmm. what people tend to do is they stop, either stop investing during that time period, trying to wait for a better time to recontinue their investments, uh, or they sell. And so through that process, it's a fascinating mental thing, mm -hmm. but through that process, most people end up buying high and selling low mm. and underperforming the very assets that they're buying if they turn off <laughs> if they turn off their brains mm. and they just buy every single month and they ignore all economic forecasts all stock market forecasts they will earn the returns of the products that they're buying mm. and that's so challenging for people so yeah. so it's it's something that I'll be spending time talking about um and relating to Norse god mythology as I do it. Oh, I, yeah. think, I think stories are really important when you're trying to explain concepts, so I enjoy that part of it. So who's your Norse god of choice? Is that Odin? <laughs> Odin and Loki oh. are the stars yeah. of the show here. Mm -hmm. So here's how this works. 200 years ago, assume that Odin says to Loki... And Loki is a Norse god of, like, mischief. And you may be familiar with him through the Avenger series. Like, he's Thor's half-brother in the Avenger series. He's the naughty one. He is yeah. the naughty one. Yeah. So, Odin is, in the series, Odin is their father. And so, I explain it this way. I say, 200 years ago, Odin says to Loki, Okay, look, you're in charge of the stock market, Loki, but there's only one rule. And that's that the global stock market's return over a 30-year period has to, and you have to ensure that it averages between 8 to 11% per year over every 30-year period. So he says this to Loki 200 years ago. And then he says, Loki, if at any time, any 30-year period, the markets don't end up earning between 8 to 11%, I'll end you. So Loki being the trickster says, okay, um, I don't want to die. I'm going to make sure that returns are between 8 to 11% per year. But I am going to mess with people as much as I can during different calendar years and different decades to try and completely screw them <laughs> up. And if I can screw them up, if I can make them fearful, and I can make them greedy, then I can ensure that people don't end up earning the returns that they really do deserve mm. and then that's your crisis is that your speculation that's your economic downturns your banks messing up things correct the news yeah yeah, yeah. the news yeah the and, wars, it, and it's uh, the perils of life it, it typically affects men more than it affects women so what i've found so i've been giving these talks for about 16 years mm. and variety of different countries it doesn't seem to matter where i go when I go back to a country where I've given a talk and I've sat down and I've given people really clear instructions, okay, here's how to build a portfolio of index funds, mm. add money every month, and you'll do well. And I might see a couple that I haven't seen in a dozen years and I'm excited mm. because I'll say, wow, okay, we sat together 12 years ago. How's it going? And and invariably there are some sheepish looks mm. because <laughs> one side of the couple typically decided they were going to speculate. Mm. And do you know what gender it almost always is? Clearly the females. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's the men. It's the men. And so theoretically, it could be to do with testosterone. Yeah. And perhaps men, we think we know things that we don't know. And so, so many times people will say things like, well, I don't want to start investing now because the markets are at or near an all-time mm -hmm. high. And, and what those people don't understand is that if the markets didn't continue to hit all-time highs, we wouldn't make money. Mm. So as an example, in 1989, that's when I started to invest. Mm. The markets were, an all, were at an all-time high then. 
And I'm just glad that I didn't know it. Right, yeah, okay. I just kept adding money every mm-hmm. single month. Others will say to me, and again, it's mostly men, mm-hmm. they'll say, but you know, um, there are economic cycles, mm-hmm. and I'm going to wait until the next stock market drop. Mm-hmm. Okay, so <laughs> this mm-hmm. is completely wrong-headed because you don't know when the next stock market drop is. Ever, really. Right, no one, no mm-hmm. one does. I mean, Warren Buffett says stock market forecasters mm-hmm. exist to make fortune tellers look good. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. And it's entirely true. There's a joke on Wall Street that economists have predicted 100 of the last two stock market crashes. All right. Mm. If you're following the advice of economists, you're going to do horribly as an investor. Of course, especially if if you watch the news, there's so much drama about Trump and about Brexit and so much political uh, discussions that can be that can scare people into I'm gonna I'm not gonna invest now because Trump's in in power and we have to do it after or, or I'm not gonna do it now because of Brexit or little things like that. Especially if you watch the news, you're doomed. <laughs> That's Loki. Yeah. Yeah. So when I describe this, I say Loki is in your ear. Loki is working out and manipulating, manipulating the media. Mm. Loki is almost like an ego, isn't it? It's just the ego tricking you. Exactly. Because we were talking, and I think this might sort of cross over. We were talking briefly before about, I have recently on a holiday where I spent a week with, with lots of people who are getting married and looking at their financial futures, and lots of them are buying property in the UK. And the conversation was rolling at the table, and it was, a, it was something I don't know anything about. So for me, I was thinking, okay, this is where this is the route where I want to go down because this makes more sense to me to invest and save and blah blah blah. So this is my stay the course mentality. But now I'm sitting at a table. I'm thinking, uh oh, should I be investing in property? Should I be saving for a deposit? Should I be looking into that world on yields and on rent and how to get mm. money back? And that's almost like you're saying. That's like my Loki just trying to speculate in my own head which is a better option (laughs) right yeah Um, your investment time duration whether you're buying property or whether you're buying into the stock and bond markets um, your investment time so Caroline you told me your age do Mm -hmm. you mind me repeating it no it's fine okay so Caroline says she's 30 she's (laughs) (laughs) she's she's youngest looking 50 year old I've ever seen she's unbelievable Keith isn't she unbelievable I mean just look at the podcasts and check out Caroline at 50 incredible exactly (laughs) the best 50 year old out there (laughs) Caroline is 34 and she looks young younger than 34 but the 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 point here um is what was my point your lifetime of your property. Ah, there. yeah, yeah, good. Thanks, thanks. I got uh, I got off track <laughs> with the old age thing. Um, it's probably because it's my birthday tomorrow. So oh. I'm like fascinated with the old. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh. I know. I turn 49 tomorrow. It's huge. Wow. But so, Caroline. You're the best um, looking 49 year old here. Thanks, man. Uh-huh. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. In, I'm the best looking 49 year old in the room. Yeah. <laughs> I'm probably the only one. Well, let's not speculate. <laughs> you get in trouble if you yeah. guess people's ages. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, Caroline's 34. Um, Caroline, your investment time duration is more than 50 years. Mm-hmm. And, and here's what trips people up, whether they're buying property or whether they're buying stock and bond market investments. They always think about this year and right now. Mm. But the bottom line really is your lifetime. So as an investor, your lifetime of investing should be the length of which, the which you're going to be alive. Mm-hmm. So you're going to live well into it, perhaps beyond your mm-hmm. 80s. Yeah, no, I think I'm going to like, I'm going to reach close to 100. That's my goal. I'm going to, this body's going to get there. You can do it. <laughs> yeah. You can do it. Mentally, yeah. I'm there, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and so the whole idea of um, like trying to time things, trying mm-hmm. to time property markets and such. The, the, one, the one thing I find really fascinating is when people will say <laughs> property is better than investing in the stock market. And then others will say investing in the stock market is better than property. Both people, when they make such statements, are not revealing their sophistication. Mm. They're revealing their ignorance. And I say that for several reasons. One is when you're investing in the stock market, what are you buying, first of all? Mm. So if you're out there trying to buy individual shares and to do well with that, well, long term, long term, I'm not talking about one year or two years or even 10 years. I'm talking about over 30 years. If that's your habit, long term, you are stacking the deck against you. If you're buying a structural savings scheme such that are sold here prolifically, 
We Long spoke term? about this by Devere and some of those companies. Oh, you mentioned them? Are you I allowed did. to mention them? Yeah. Are you allowed to mention I them? I don't care. We can yeah, mention okay, them. Why not? <laughs> well, long term, you've completely screwed yourself. Mm. And the longer you stay in those things, the more money you lose. Um, likewise, when we look at property, when people say, oh, property is a good investment or property is or isn't better than stock market investment. That's like saying buying a business is a good investment. Mm. Because when you're buying property, you are buying a business. And many people don't think of it that way. When you're buying a property, you're looking at it just the same as if you were buying a corner store. So if you were buying a corner store, it's like saying buying corner stores is a great investment. Now hang on. Where's the corner store? What's the clientele that's coming in? What's the revenue that's generated from it? What's the maintenance that's associated with it? Um, what's the upkeep, perhaps, of mm. the building? Uh, all of these types of factors. What are the taxes associated with running it? Um, what, what are the, I guess, the capex or the capital expenses that are associated with like keeping it going, the, the advertising and such? When you're buying a property, it's much the same. Mm. Where properties aren't all created equal a property is a business so once you've decided to buy a property and you're not living in it you've bought it strictly for investment purposes this can be great because you're leveraging so you're putting a certain amount of money down somebody else is purchasing or buying uh, paying the mortgage for you mm. but there's so many factors to consider like what is the yield on the property mm. and you must always start with yield yield is really important do you guys know what i mean by that not explain really. Anyway. Maybe explain, explain it. it. Yeah, if yeah. You can. I will. Let's say you buy a uh, a property with th that's a uh, hundred thousand pounds. Just keep this really simple. And let's say you can rent it for ten thousand pounds a year. Mm -hmm. Well, you divide ten thousand by a hundred thousand, and now you have a property yield of ten percent. Yeah. So this is your business earnings mm -hmm. before taxes, before maintenance. Mm -hmm. You have to. You mm -hmm. must, you must determine what the business earnings yield is when you buy any business. And a property is a business. Mm -hmm. And so now you have a benchmark to compare one property in one location with a property in another location. Because all locations and all properties are not created equally. You'll have properties where the investment yield is as low as 25 or 3%. Mm -hmm. And you'll have properties where investment yields can be 10%. <laughs> and then again, there's the, the factor of how much maintenance has to go into this property and what kind mm. of tenants am I going to get? So if you're going to get strong professional tenants that you hope will stay, be able to pay the rent, not knock holes in the walls when they get drunk. So, I mean, these are all mm. factors that have to come into play. And so you're weighing a whole series of several things because what you'll find is if you have a property that's going to be attracting quality tenants, you're also going to give up part of the yield mm -hmm. because there's less risk with quality tenants. So with property, um, I mean, we could write an entire 400-page book mm -hmm. to do the topic justice. And again, to go right back to the very beginning, just to say to say something like property is better than stock investing or vice, ver or vice versa, does not reveal sophistication. It reveals yeah. ignorance. Yeah. I in my in my mind in my understanding, just from what I've read recently, um, that doing in either investing in the stock market or in property, it's doing the same thing just in different ways. It's just a different avenue, particularly if you're doing it to generate cash flow as opposed to to f other reasons mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. so you're essentially trying to buy property to increase your cash flow so that it covers your living expenses and eventually is supporting your lifestyle so in my mind it's like doing the same thing just different ways but it's mm -hmm. a totally different roadmap is that right yeah it is and you're right because in both cases you're working towards increasing future cash flow mm -hmm. so in both cases this is good but again in both cases you don't just sort of listen to one person if you sat around in Dubai and you listened to someone about stock market investing and you waited for someone in a nice suit to come and tell you how to do it you're gonna get screwed right likewise if you just think oh, I'll buy any old property because property is a great investment <laughs> without really doing your researching and understanding the business perspective, um, then you can get into trouble, especially because uh, the benefit of leverage also has a downside. So we were talking a bit about that earlier, Keith, where in some cases, um, if people aren't really paying much attention to yield 
and they pay a high price for a property and that price drops considerably, you have an economic downturn or whatever that might be. Now you have the risk of potentially not having a tenant that can pay the same degree of, um, of rent hence your mortgage. And you may be in a situation where you owe more money than the home is actually worth. Mm. So there's some thinking that's associated with all of this. But this kind of thinking, back to Caroline, back to your point, is the right kind of thinking. Mm. This is what we need to do to build future cash flow for us and to build future wealth. We need to make these decisions and start working in these directions positively. Mm. Make, make a step and make a move and go with it. I have a couple of questions. Um, what about the argument for the property avenue that says when you're 10, 15 years down the line, you have an asset that, like we just kind of spoke about, you hope is worth more to sell than it was when you bought it. So Sorry, can I just interject there? Because I remember the last time you were here, you showed that presentation about uh, property and stock markets and the difference in in their performance over a time frame. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yeah. 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 I Do you remember that? Not that, specifically that one. That graph, it showed the difference between if you had bought property at some stage and if, say, like 100 years ago and you had bought um, stocks, what the difference in value were over time. Sorry. I rem and there's the two stocks, things. I guess, won out. Um, <laughs> so, so dramatically. Yeah. So dramatically. What if you had it then... Yeah. Because this is what I'm, I'm... Not in counting leverage. So what does leverage mean in that instance? So leverage is like uh, when you, you know, when you say, who's that Greek philosopher who said, like, give me a stick long enough and I can move the world? A mm. stick and a fulcrum. I think that so was Keith. That was Keith. It was yeah. definitely it was Keith. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that ancient Greek philosopher, God. Keith. <laughs> <laughs> leverage is when you're borrowing money. So that's the wonderful part about property. So property price appreciation long term doesn't come close to the stock market mm. not even close so i'll give you an example um one of the best property markets in the last hundred years in terms of actual appreciation has been vancouver british columbia mm. so extraordinarily expensive for what you get so in 1994 um, the median home value in vancouver was three hundred and sixty thousand mm. dollars which even then is quite a bit today it's 1.6 million really yeah however and that's yeah. a, that's the median so that's the median yeah, it's crazy that's the median crazy. like single family home mm. in vancouver these aren't big homes yeah, these yeah. Are just i lived in vancouver for a bit vancouver is beautiful just mm. as an aside which is one of the reasons why it's so expensive yeah. because people really really want to be there mm. um but on the flip side you know if you had invested $300,000 in 1994 in say a US stock market index today it's worth over $3 million mm -hmm. so the appreciation plus the dividends were significantly sure. outstripped mm -hmm. the Vancouver real estate market and the Vancouver real estate market has been extraordinary over the last yeah 25 30 years mm -hmm. so the the power though with real estate and I don't want to downplay it the power is through the leverage. So you put less money down, mm -hmm. you're borrowing money, and somebody else is paying off your debt and paying your mortgage. Mm -hmm. yeah. Doing it intelligently is a, is a great way to build wealth. What mm -hmm. I like is the idea that um, if you're going to do one or the other, great, do it intelligently. Doing both, if you can, if you have the financial resources, can be even better because sure. you've fully diversified now yeah. your portfolio and your future wealth base. Mm -hmm. The second thing that I'd like to know, just in a bullet point format without having to go too deep, what would the considerations have to be if you're thinking about looking into property from abroad? What are the kind mm. of avenues I need to go down? I need to look up, obviously, the price. I need to look up how much um, down payment I need to put on a property. Right. What kind of yields... Right. Yes. Was there anything else on that list? Is there any, does the list need to be more concise than that? Mm, you need to look at um, what is the property itself in terms of in terms of how much would it cost to maintain it, and and this takes a lot of digging because a real estate agent is going to tell you one thing, but remember they're salespeople, so now you're going to need to dig into. <laughs> you can hear the blender in the background. Yeah. It's yeah. great. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's okay. It's good. This is real life. This is real world. You're going to need to look at like, how much does it actually cost to maintain this property. So, again, 
not all properties are created equal in this respect. So if it's an older property, yeah. you know, you're going to end up with higher maintenance costs than if it's a younger or newer property. Um, and many people get swayed by this and brush over this. They go, yeah, 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 that's not important because of human emotion. So we get back to human emotion. When you're investing, whether it's property investing mm -hmm. or whether it's investing in the stock market, you almost have to think like a robot. You have to turn off your heart and mm -hmm. just use yeah. your head. The be very another analytical. Uh, yeah, be very mm -hmm. analytical. Another really interesting factor is when you're property investing, when you're looking at it, and this is a, coming back, Keith, to your question about yield. This is so important. There's a reason that multimillionaires don't go around buying up single family homes. Like you really do not meet people worth a hundred million dollars that own 500 single family homes. No, they don't. Because it's, an, it's, the, it's the most inefficient way to purchase a property. Mm. So right now I'm sitting in, wh what is this place we're sitting in? It's some kind of shopping mall. Or oh, uh, it's like an office block. It's an office block. Oh, yeah, with a okay. coffee shop in the middle. Yeah. So somebody owns this office block, somebody very wealthy. Mm. And when I look around, I see multiple sources of revenue for that person. So this particular coffee shop um, pays rent. Mm. That bike shop, it's across there pays rent so when you have multiple sources of revenue and only one roof to maintain you typically will end up with a higher yield mm. which is why wealthy people when they buy properties they consider multiple sources of revenue so case in point now we'll give you an example with an individual investor say you're wanting to buy a property and let's say you're looking at say you're looking at Ireland and you see a couple of properties and you're interested in them and one of them has two units if it's in the same neighborhood with all other things being equal in terms of clientele, in terms of um, age of the building, the property with two units is going to be less risky and will have a higher yield. Mm. Because if you lose one tenant, so one tenant lose their, loses their job or they die, at least you still have one other tenant that can actually help you with the mortgage. And, and the overall, when you're looking at this building, you have one roof to maintain you have four walls on the outside, you mm -hmm. only have one garden to maintain, but you have two sources of revenue. So when all other things are equal, a triplex, I mean a property with three rental units within it, is better than one with two. A quad with four mm -hmm. is better than one with three or two, when all other things are equal. So again, coming back to this, this is the this is a business decision, but most people just close their eyes and go, property is a good, in <laughs> is a good investment because yeah. the price of the home goes yeah. up in value. Mm -hmm. That in itself is an incredibly unsophisticated way of looking at it, and you can boost your profits by being a bit more sophisticated. I think as well what I've heard a lot of, a lot of uh, people in my age group, they're looking just to buy a family home or just that that's it. It's like, I'm going to buy a house, I'm going to buy property just to get on the property ladder and that's it. That's mm. what I'm buying. They're not thinking about uh, anything beyond just owning that one residential property as right. opposed to what about my retirement or what about beyond when I pay that off. Mm -hmm. That's quite interesting. But something you said to me, there's a few things that you said last time that really stuck with me. One was about inflation, um, about the 3% inflation. Now everywhere I look, do you know where you go and you deposit money into a bank and they're like, oh, we'll give you 1% bank if you don't touch it in a year. <laughs> and I look at that and I think, oh my God. You've lost money. I've lost money. Yeah. <laughs> I have, and I never factored in that whole inflation aspect. Now I just see it everywhere. It's, it's you interesting. You lost money because you lost purchasing power. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when we look at developed world markets over the last 100 years, inflation's averaged about 3.4% per year. Sometimes it's lower, and sometimes it's a lot higher. So we've had inflation that's been 12%, 13% per year, like in the early 1980s. In the United Kingdom over the last decade, inflation ran 2 0.2% on average compounding. And so what that means is if somebody invested 10,000 pounds 10 years ago, and today it was worth 12,400 pounds, they've actually lost money. Yeah. Mm. And a lot of people don't recognize that. So exactly, if you put money in a savings account and it's there for a lengthy period of time, mm. yet yeah, you've lost money. And, and back, Caroline, to what you were talking about with um, many expats are saying, look, I want... I want to buy some kind of future shelter. Mm. And that's what a property is great for. If they're not thinking about yeah. it as... Um, 
it's security for it's a lot secu- of people. It's important. It's a place that they're going to be able to live yeah. when they do go back home. So I, yeah. I understand that for sure. For a lot of people, it's it's okay. When I retire, I need to have a place that I can live right. that it's going to be paid off. And that's not an investment mm. for future cash flow because you have to live somewhere. But it's an investment in future shelter and your life. Mm. So this is really this is this can be really important for expats to have something that they can go back home to. So mm. they they put a down payment on a property. And of course that can be really challenging as Keith was talking about because when you're a non-resident and you're trying to get a mortgage for a mm. property, often you have to have a really big yeah. down payment. Mm. So Keith was talking about Yeah, I've experienced that in a, in huge. a meeting with a bank manager a long time ago. She well, told me I need a 50% down payment. I said, thanks, see you later. <laughs> do, you, do you know <laughs> what's know. interesting? It's like when you think about shelter, because I think about, okay, like if I need to go back to Australia and I think about shelter, I don't need to live in a five bedroom family home. What about if I just buy a shitty apartment and someone that I can afford um, and it doesn't really need to be anywhere and I can pay it off straight away as opposed to having to get a mortgage, having to deal with that inflation component and then the a loan and loan repayments and interest. What about if shelter was just like, just roof? Well, what if I you, don't know. This is what, what I was thinking rented, about I mean, in my head. What if you rented somewhere super cost effective, do you know? And then you continued on your, on your savings plan. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. just got to weigh out then how much is how much is the mm. dead inverted commas money that you're paying in rent in relation right. to what you're yeah. getting back from your from your interest. Right, right. I mean, again, there's there's no way of really seeing the future on this one. So knowing which is going to be better, leveraging and buying the property or you know, investing in the stock and bond markets, it's going to be really tough to see the future on it. But mm-hmm. you have to do both of them intelligently. For for Pelly and for me, for my wife and for me. Um, that's actually grammatically correct. It doesn't sound like it, right? For Pelly and for me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an English teacher. It <laughs> sounds weird, even though it's, I say it, it sounds weird. For us, what we, what we decided to do was um, we're, we're really lazy. And <laughs> real estate comes with something called the PETA factor. It's a, it's a really a technical economic term. P-I-T-A. And, and it stands for... You know what it stands for? Pain in the ass. Sounds like oh <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pain in the ass. Uh, <laughs> and so for us, and again, this is just a personal thing for us. For us, we we didn't want to deal with tenants. Mm. Um, we didn't want to deal with having a property overseas. This is my view. You're, I think you're tipping into my view as well. So what we did was we invested our money in the stock and bond markets, and when we decided to purchase a property which we did in victoria british columbia Mm. we just paid cash Mm. so we were able then to sell um a portion of our investment portfolio and then no hassles no Mm. mortgage no mess go in and transfer money and make a purchase with cash yeah and that just felt to us and again there's a psychological emotional aspect to all of this too there's the PETA factor that pelly and i didn't want to get into Mm. for us that was the ideal yeah, I like that idea. My little sister and I are talking about that too. So we were in the process of, so obviously aside from having this conversation and investing, my little sister's very much uh, into, we need to look after each other. This is, we need to buy property. So I was like, okay, we'll do this together. So we were both under the same thing of, uh, we don't want a loan. We don't want a mortgage. Let's just buy like a sm- something that we can both afford and just buy in cash. So mm. we don't have to have any of that, that hassle. And it's, it's like, you know, she's the only family I have. So it's like our thing. Right. Um, that made sense to us as well. Very similar to, to you guys, obviously different <laughs> and it's an emotional thing though it right is, and so it is. we can't we can't discount those other factors mm. of what, what we really want and what allows us to sleep at night i mean on, you know on the flip side there are many people that are and keith you were talking about this earlier who are very comfortable leveraging one property against another against another against another and, and building an empire based on debt uh, which can accentuate gains but can also accentuate tough times and losses so probably one of the most sort of famous financial gurus in the united states he has this crazy prolific following and radio show Uh, he's written loads of books but his name is dave ramses Mm. so dave ramses earlier on in his lifetime built a couple of fortunes with property 
by leveraging, mm. putting one property as collateral against another, yeah. leveraging, building, building, building. And on two occasions as a result of that, he ended up building fortunes that he ended up losing because he overextended himself. And now this man is like evangelical. He's gone, the, he's gone so far the other way, which I, I think is a little crazy too, mm. where he's saying, if you're going to buy a house, don't get a mortgage. Mm. Pay cash for your house. For a lot of people, that's just not realistic. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to be buying a place in Melbourne, Australia, mm. you know, good luck trying to buy that without a mortgage unless you're making gobs well, of money. Do you know what's really interesting when you were talking about Vancouver? my I remember my mom talking to me about it, what a one-bedroom apartment in maybe it was one or two bedroom apartment in Bondi in the 70s cost. It was $70,000 to buy an apartment. Today, it's $2 million, one to $2 million. That's what an apartment in Bondi costs. People can't afford that. Like, yeah. I think those yeah. prices have gotten to where they are because of international investors that come into Sydney, particularly right. from Southeast Asia, and they buy a lot of property. And so it's inflated the prices massively because I don't know any person that's an act- that's Australian that lives and works in Australia that can afford an apartment that's $2 million in their home country where they grew up, the right. school that they went to. People can't afford that. I don't know anyone who can pay off a mortgage like that. Um, right. But mental, I don't know what the point of that story was. No, you're right. No, no, it's, it's, a really good, it's a really good point, right? It's mm. just not practical mm. um, in ma- many of these cases to end up buying these properties. I'm going to put this in perspective too yeah. with Australia. If we put uh, same, same $70,000 in the Australian stock market in the mid-1970s, Right, that 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 same amount of money today would be worth about six to seven million dollars. Mm. Be worth much more than that property. So yeah. again, many people really discount uh, the growth rate of investing in the stock market when you're going to do it properly. Yeah, and that's not even accounting for like service fees and apartments and maintenance right. and having to yeah. the Peter repair. factor. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. fix things and. Yeah. And I don't want to be that person ever to say don't invest in property. Mm. Um, I'm a big fan, especially when you're looking at the yields and you're getting into multiplexes. But I really try to emphasize, just like investing in the stock market, you've got to do it right. Mm. You can't just do it willy-nilly. Yeah. Do you get a better rate on your place, just out of curiosity, if you buy cash? Is there any advantage to buying cash, rather than aside from not paying the interest on the mortgage, but in the actual transaction process? Oh, that would be nice, but... No, typically no. One of the things that you do have, and I I guess you have a better negotiating tool. So if you're looking at buying a property, often people will say this is subject to financing. So here's my offer for your property. It's subject to financing. And so when you get multiple bids in sometimes and you have one that's subject to financing, so this property is worth, I don't know, whatever it's, uh, say it's a million dollar property and somebody puts in an offer and says, yeah, I'll pay a million dollars for it subject to financing. I put in an offer that says, I'll put in $950,000, not subject to financing. Yeah, I sure. Guarantee, I, I put this purchase through it. So I don't, have to, I don't have to sell anything beforehand. I don't have to make sure that um, I'm going to be uh, approved for that particular mortgage. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's a nice leveraging tool to actually mm-hmm. buy the property um, and get a lower price for it. Sometimes, sometimes. Sure. Um, but the transactional costs are typically... Um, other than what you just mentioned there in terms of just the interest that you'd end up paying over yeah. time, that's really the only advantage to paying the cash in that respect. Mm. So then the other thing, like as you talk about that kind of, you know, if you were to put down 70,000 in Australia, you get 67, is it a million you said back. How do you know, where do you as a person get or all six that to from? Six to seven million. Oh, six yeah, to yeah. Seven. Not 67 million, but yeah, oh, six wow. to seven million. <laughs> yeah. But, like, how, where do you read or what do you follow? What, what, are you, what resources are you tapping into to get all that? Because you're an English teacher. Mm-hmm. Now you're traveling the world um, and you've written books. Right. Is it all just... Is it just goes in one ear and you just absorb it? or Yeah, yeah, mostly. Um, a lot of things financial. For whatever reason, my brain is a bit like a steel trap. So then I read a credible source in uh, a journal of finance or real estate journals. And, and often if I'm interested in them, I'll remember them. So mm-hmm. I remember stories and I remember movies, but I won't remember my phone number. Mm. Right. <laughs> Where does that interest come from? Like wh- you, you take out the Financial Times and you, you read it and you get all the way to the end of the article without drifting off into another world like where do you where do you think that interest comes from yeah that's a really good question i think um 
I think it, for me today, it comes from, can I take something that's applicable from a particular article and then can I shape it such that I can explain it to people? First of all, most things that are written um, have fin in financial papers have really little, and I shouldn't say financial papers because I want to talk academic journals here because that's really what we're talking about me reading. Um, that's where the meat is. It's not mm -hmm. in the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times. That stuff's just fluff. Yeah, because that's day to day like stuff. It's clickbait, exactly. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about reading in financial journals or reading in a really good credited financial book, if I read something that I think is applicable to everyday people that could really genuinely help them, what I tend to do is I, such a good question, Keith, I tend to reshape it in a way in my mind as I'm reading it in a way that would be good to explain to somebody really simply. So if it's a concept that can help people, I put that in the back of my head and I mull it over. So I'm not just reading it. I read it and I think about it. So I might read a paragraph and then I don't drift off. I think, how can I say that same thing simpler? I found something really cool here. Okay, this is something that can apply to everyday people. How can I say that simply? How can I create a story? How can I create an analogy which makes this relevant and helpful to other people? So mm -hmm. I guess it's not like I'm someone with a photographic memory because I'm not, but I think that I engage in the writing material and I think about it from an educator's perspective on how I can then end up, if it's relevant, how I can use it to help other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. So you're reading it with the you're reading it with the view of being a middleman being like a translator being yeah being an educator yeah, yeah. exactly mm. and then i suppose that in a way that's always better for you and because it keeps you in tune with what's going on it keeps you because i always find if i'm trying to if i'm trying to understand something in new in this si sports science world if i can figure out a way to explain it to people mm -hmm. and then explain it two different ways then i know that i really know it yeah. And then I can really like, if, yeah. if the message still isn't landing, I can almost reverse engineer it or pick it apart or like find a way to make it land. Yeah. Um, but when I, geez, when I read, that's it. I can do that with exercise and over here. Yeah. I can't do that with I think it's because it's a language that you understand. So, like, for example, I think we spoke about this last time. Like, when I was at university, I remember the back of our medical books had, um, like, terminology. And it would be like, pathology means this. Like, apoptosis means this. And it's really understanding that terminology. I think both of us and many, many other people don't understand the financial terminology. So, when you get in there, it's like you're looking at Chinese. And it's like... Oh my God, it's yeah. it's overbearing. But I think once you understand all of that terminology, it becomes easier to feel like, oh yeah, I I see I see the letters in the Chinese as opposed to just seeing Chinese. I can't even um. speak to our company accountants. Like, I want to know how much money is in there that's profit for growth. These are your receivables. These are your things. These are your assets. These are your. I'm like, I don't I don't know what that means. I don't right. know what any of that means. <laughs> just can you give me a number at the end of the month that is like minus it's zero or it's plus and then the <laughs> number <laughs> just i need just that's all i need to know and then he, he sends across the thing and goes here's your number but it's it's wrapped up in a pnl with all the jargon i'm like i don't i don't know how well i don't know what to do yeah well it, it, it's yeah. actually sorry to interrupt you but it's the same thing that we were talking about the the brokerage things like they give you at the very end everything in a pnl and in all of this other terminology and i'm like i don't know what that <laughs> means <laughs> what are you talking about just tell me in english yeah. is is this good or is it bad right. i've come to realize in those brokerage accounts things that green is good and red is bad <laughs> so <laughs> i know what's happening because of the colors and and so to to go when you, when you said green is good and red is bad um what you're looking at is gains and green yes. and losses and red now let's bring this full circle Write to why down if, you, if you want to Carolyn. <laughs> let's bring this full circle to why i'm here today so if you were to invest regularly the the best thing you could actually hope for is for you to be investing money all year and when for the markets, red, right. the markets to drop every month during that year yeah. and you continue to invest and it continues to go lower and lower and lower. This is something that I'll talk about at the sessions and I explain it why this is actually, this is actually good. So you think of yourself as a collector. Mm. If you're a collector of something, do you want the prices of the things that you're collecting 
to go up in value while you're collecting them or down in value? Yeah, down in value whilst you're purchasing them. You want them Correct. to be as cheap as possible. Correct, yeah. which is why Warren Buffett says that prospective purchasers mm -hmm. of stock market investments should hope for flat or falling markets. So as people who are, we are relatively young, we are l far from a traditional retirement age, retirees should be very happy to see their portfolios rise in value. We should be disappointed to see our portfolios rise in value. Mm. And so this is a really tough thing for most people to actually get their head, heads around. They'll celebrate when their portfolio rises. Now, we know that during 66% of calendar years, the stock market rises. Mm. So we just have to shrug our shoulders and say, well, that's just the way it is. Most years, the stock market rises. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's flat and it falls. Like this year, it's been apparently quite volatile. <laughs> This, it's so interesting that mm. we, we look, especially when we're new investors, mm. and if you look over the last decade, uh, we've really had no volatility for 10 years. Mm. Oh. And so the last year, a lot of new investors are saying, wow, in December of 2018, well, mm. look at the big drop. Wow, we had such a volatile time. And they congratulate themselves mm. for staying the course. And wow, I can handle this. I really can because 2018, things went up and down and I, I hung in there. Mm -hmm. Well, in 2018, the markets dropped about 6%. Mm. That's not a drop. You know, so mid-year, okay, it went up and then it came down quite a bit. Real drops, real drops. When your portfolio falls, 38% in a year. 30% mm. in a year. So you might get 20% in one year and then it falls another 15 or 20% the next year. And maybe it falls another 12 or 13% next year. And that's when you buy. <laughs> yeah, well, you always buy. So yeah. back to the timing <laughs> thing. It's not timing the stock market that mm -hmm. matters. It's time in the market. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, back to your point. Always buy. Buy every month, regardless of what the stock market's doing, regardless mm -hmm. of what anyone is trying to predict. And when your portfolio is sinking while you are purchasing, you really need to celebrate because what you're doing is you are literally loading up money on a catapult. Mm. And the longer that ancient catapult stays in that lockdown position, the more money you're going to make when that catapult releases and the stock markets recover. So mm. personally, I love stock market crashes. <laughs> I want one tomorrow. So, so <laughs> I want my portfolio to lose $1 million next week. Mm. I would love that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely love that. And people that don't understand that concept really need to get that concept through their heads in order to invest effectively to give them the highest statistical odds of staying the course financially. Because remember what I talked about Loki? during any 30-year duration. Mm -hmm. We can roll through any 30-year duration. Global markets have returned between 8 to 11% per year during sometimes decade periods. Sometimes decade periods there haven't been gains. Mm. Mm. But that's not relevant. It's 30-year durations, long-term. Mm. Well, that's, isn't, you've got more money in the, uh, in the account after the 10 years are up, and then the, the percentage on that is exactly. higher. Exactly. Mm. Then when it grows, it just... It just flies. Yeah. Yes, yes. But so many people, Keith, are afraid. If you, what you'll find is if the markets go through a period of, say, a decade where they really don't make any money, what you'll find is the average person becomes more and more reluctant to add money to it because mm -hmm. they say, quote, this doesn't work. That's Loki. Mm -hmm. Again, the Norse god of mischief just trying to screw you yeah. up. Mm. That's all that is. You're only really screwed if you're trying to sell. Ex exactly. Okay. Or if you're ceasing to add fresh money. If you just say, I'm going to sell, you're right. Or I'm not going to buy because stock markets haven't returned well over the last two, three, five, six years. Whoa, those are golden moments. I love mm. them. So the, kick isn't, the, the key isn't to predict the downside or the upside. The key is to stay alive long enough. The, to yes. put more money in there, to, be, to not have to buy out or pass away when it's Correct. at a low amount. The, the key is not to try to predict. 
not to try and predict when the next market crash is, mm -hmm. just to keep investing every single month. So, yeah. so the plan is you basically invest every single month. You don't look at it and you just keep doing that. And that's it. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Which is why and when we look at and just keep going and yeah. earn more money. I got that. Do you know what I loved about it? Because I got that last time. Yeah. That's the part that I understood. And maybe you can actually tell people what we spoke about just before it started, because I feel like I understood that section like solidified in my mind and I loved it because it's so easy you literally just invest all the time that's it mm. um, and then you said to me something earlier which I think might be valuable for people to, to hear as well do you want to share that with everyone no you can correct me if I end up going down yeah. the, the wrong the wrong answering the wrong question here but <laughs> it's to it's to invest as much as you possibly can every month yeah that's it <laughs> and so you figure out okay what does it cost me to live and now what I'm going to do is, okay, you can, so many people will put aside a certain amount as a buffer. So maybe three months mm. living expenses as a buffer. Okay. I have that as a buffer, but from, and they don't, they don't touch that. They just leave that for emergencies. But once you have that buffer, you, you invest the maximum amount from your paycheck every single month and you live on the rest. Mm. So this is something that I did from like, I guess, age 19 until mm. uh, I was in my mid forties. It was at the beginning of the month, remove that money, remove the maximum amount that I can and live on what remains. Yeah. Instead of having a fixed amount, just Yeah, so down. what I was doing is I was like, I had a figure in my mind. I was like, okay, I'm just going to do this. And it was nice and easy. So I was just putting that away. And then we spoke and you're like, no, 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 no. Everything you can. So I need to yes. flip it. Yes. So the actually just live off this small amount and invest everything else. Yes, and, and Pelly would know too. I mean, sometimes just based on the the realities of I mean, we might get a bonus that month or whatever it might be, and I was absolutely thrilled to know that I could invest even. Well, I can invest even more. I published a magazine article. Mm. I can invest even more this month. So I was always really excited to try to maximize the amount of money that I was investing. So mm. I'm front end loading it, um, which is one of the reasons that money for me personally, and I've never had this massive salary. Mm. Um, so. Like I, I was thinking about it the other day and realizing that in 2007, my investment portfolio hit a million dollars in 2007. Mm. I'm a school teacher. Mm. Most of that time, I was working in a public school in Canada. Mm. So I wasn't earning this massive salary. In 2003, my salary increased quite a bit because I took a, a job teaching in Singapore mm. at a school and international school. So from 2003 to 2007, my salary increased a lot, which juiced my savings. Mm. But in the time up to 2003, I was only a public school teacher. So most of that million dollars came as a result of money that I set aside as a public school teacher in Canada and just had working for me mm. as it was sort of building and compounding. That's very so motivating. front loading. Yeah. Front loading is huge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically is invest as much as possible as early as possible. That's right. the secret. Okay. Warren, Warren Buffett yeah. started when he was uh when he was 11 and he says he started too late. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> he's joking. But he did he did start when he was 11 and he's really trying to prove like the power of compounding. And many people will say, you know, well I'm 50 or I'm 40, I'm 55, it's, it's mm -hmm. too late for me." You'll never be younger than you are right now. Mm. And no matter what you do, no matter how old you are, you can make life better for yourself by getting on this program now. Mm. No, you might not be able to build a three or four million dollar portfolio by the time you retire, but that's not the point. Mm. The point is to end up having as much as you possibly can given your current situation today. Mm. That's, I think, what's most inspiring is you can do, yeah. we can all do better. Amazing. Well, on that note, um, we'll, we'll wrap it up and let you get on with your day. Thanks a lot for coming to speak to us. What's next yeah. for you in the short term? You're doing a bit of, you doing some talks here tomorrow and then a bit of traveling and then back to Germany? You yeah, we're going to spend a month traveling through Europe and then, uh, and then back to Canada June, June the 11th. I'm looking at my wife and she says, yeah, June 11th, June 12th. Why not? Back to Canada for some long, visits. We can do it. And just remind people of the name of your books. Uh, Millionaire Expat. Uh, Millionaire Expat is the most relevant book, mm -hmm. um, obviously, for expatriate investors. Yep, so you can buy it. that on Kindle, Amazon, paperback. Mm -hmm. You can get it through Kina Cunha here. Yep. And we typically sell it at our talks here. Well, 
Sometimes we sell mm-hmm. it at our talks here. And you're giving a talk tomorrow as well. I'm at, coming. At Dubai College. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'll be there too. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Amazing. Well, Angie, next time you're in town, we'll catch up again. We'll do another check-in. Um, mm-hmm. We didn't quite go into deep onto where Caroline and I are. I think we've dodged the <laughs> bullet there. But we're on the right track. We're just not necessarily <laughs> where we had agreed we would be. But we haven't spent all our money. <laughs> let's, let's just summarize it at that. And then hopefully when you're back <laughs> next time, we can uh, have a bit more juice to talk about then. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Amazing. Right, cool. Let's do it. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Thank, Thank you. you. See you soon.